Where did Jesus go after his death? Hell? Hades? Heaven? Jesus was about to go to the most incredible journey that would amaze people for centuries, but the gates of that journey was the cross. The book of Luke tells the story of Jesus' final journey to his death, from his prayer in Gethsemane, where his faith in God is confirmed on the cross. When Jesus said, it is finished on the cross, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Before being removed and buried in a nearby tomb, his lifeless body stayed atop the cross until it was finally removed. On the other hand, his spirit was elsewhere. Where did his spirit go? Did he go to hell? Or did he go to heaven? There is some dispute regarding the whereabouts of Jesus, or more specifically, the location of his spirit for the three days between his death and resurrection. Where Jesus was in the discussion of where Jesus was for the three days between his death and resurrection, another passage is often mentioned. That is 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18-21. through 21. These verses constitute one of the most puzzling and intriguing texts in the New Testament. Jesus is the epitome of what it means to suffer for the sake of doing good, with the intention of bringing us to God and restoring our broken and dead relationship with Him. He who is just, endured suffering for all of us who are unjust. The object of all of this was to bring us to God. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 through 21. For indeed Christ died for sins once for all, the just and righteous for the unjust and unrighteous, the innocent for the guilty, so that he might bring us to God. Having been put to death in the flesh, he made alive in the spirit, in which he also went and preached to the spirits now in prison, who once were disobedient, when the great patience of God was waiting in the days of Noah, during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight persons, Noah's family, were brought safely through the water. Corresponding to that, rescue through the flood, baptism, which is an expression of a believer's new life in Christ, now saves you, not by removing dirt from the body, but by an appeal to God for a good, clear conscience, demonstrating what you believe to be yours, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We read, Being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. Despite the fact that Jesus did die in his body, the Holy Spirit was able to raise him from the dead. Through godly suffering, Jesus preached to the spirits in prison. We read, By whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient. Jesus preached to the spirits in prison with the help of the Holy Spirit. It seems that this was done after Jesus died, but before he arose from the dead. Did Jesus actually preach to the spirits in Hades? Yes, that's right. Hades is considered to be the realm of the dead, and Jesus reportedly went there to deliver his message. It's quite fascinating to think about, isn't it? We read, Preach to the spirits in prison. Have you ever wondered who has the ultimate authority and power in this world? No matter what your answer is, the Bible has a clear answer to this question. It states that even those who are under the earth, deep beneath the ground, must acknowledge Jesus as their ultimate Lord. It's a powerful statement that reminds us of the supreme power and authority that Jesus holds over all things. It's a humbling thought, but it also gives us hope and comfort knowing that we have a loving and powerful Lord who is in control of everything. Philippians chapter 2 verse 10. So that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in submission of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Behold the absolute totality of creation, recognizing the unparalleled superiority of Jesus Christ. We read of those under the earth. Close your eyes and imagine a world where the departed who rest in the bosom of the earth, can be awakened to life once again by the mighty power of Christ. Sounds like a scene straight out of a captivating novel, doesn't it? Every knee should bow, every tongue should confess. The combination of tongues confessing and knees bowing gives evidence that the idea is a complete submission to Jesus, both in word and in action, and one that is required of all. Imagine a scene where people from all walks of life come together their tongues confessing and their knees bowing in complete submission to Jesus. It's a powerful image that speaks of a deep connection, a unified belief, and an unwavering faith. 
We are all required to give ourselves fully to Him, not just in words, but in actions too. This idea of complete surrender to Jesus is both humbling and empowering, and it's something that can inspire us all to live more meaningful lives. Due to the totality of this acknowledgement of Jesus' deity, numerous people imagine this taking place formally after the Last Judgment, when all creatures in heaven and hell are compelled to kneel and declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. The Identity of the Spirits here, the spirits in prison are clearly identified. Who were they? Those who were disobedient. When were they disobedient? The times of Noah. Different Interpretations While most of 1 Peter is easy to understand, there is one problem. These verses have at least 314 different interpretations. As the scripture states, Jesus was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit, which he went and preached to those who were disobedient in the days of Noah's flood. A few verses later, Peter says, For this is why the good news of salvation was preached in their lifetimes, even to those who are dead, that though they were judged in the flesh as men are, they may live in the Spirit according to the will and purpose of God. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 6. Even though every other scripture indicates it is impossible, some have erroneously used this text to support their teaching of more chances of redemption in the afterlife. Death seals our fate. Death marks the beginning of an immense chasm. But here, apparently, Jesus did preach to those who had died. How is it to be comprehended? According to the text, it is evident that Jesus was actively communicating with others and remained conscious during the time between his death and resurrection. The individuals he communicated with were also fully conscious and engaged in communication with him. It's interesting to note that there is very little discussion about what happened on Saturday during Holy Week services, as they typically end on Friday and resume on Sunday. So you are never told what Jesus was doing on Saturday. It is a common belief that Jesus was inactive and unconscious after his death and before his resurrection, as his body remained in the tomb. However, it is important to note that despite his physical death, his spirit was still very much alive. After he passed away, he went to the world of the dead and preached there. I can picture Peter coming face to face with Jesus on the very first Easter Sunday and asking, Jesus, where on earth have you been? In response, I have not actually been on earth, rather I have been in Hades, which is the world of the dead. What on earth or what in Hades have you been doing there? Jesus tells Peter that he was preaching to those who were drowned in Noah's flood. Death separates the spirit and the body. In less than a week, Jesus experienced all three stages, being an embodied spirit, dying on the cross and commending his spirit to God, and finally, his body being put in the tomb. He continued to exist in his spirit form and preached to the disobedient people who perished in Noah's flood. On Easter Sunday morning, his body and spirit were reunited, and he remained fully conscious and able to communicate throughout all these stages. There are those who believe his message was a message to Noah's generation only. Some individuals hold the view that the second chance after the Great Flood was granted only to one generation, and there is no indication in the Bible that any other generation would receive such an opportunity. This generation could have accused God of being unjust and unfair. They could say, You wiped us out and then promised never to do it again. The second interpretation is demonic spirits. Within the context of this view, the spirits that Jesus addressed could be demonic beings. If the spirits referenced in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 19 are fallen angels, then it seems likely that those spirits were imprisoned because they were involved in a grave sin prior to the deluge that occurred during the period of Noah. Peter makes reference to Noah's flood in verse 20. If these were indeed fallen angels, it could not have been a message of redemption since angels cannot be saved. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 16. For, as we all know, he, Christ, does not take hold of the fallen angels to give them a helping hand, but he does take hold of the fallen descendants of Abraham, extending to them his hand of deliverance. If these were fallen angels, Jesus' proclamation likely declared his victory over Satan and his hosts. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 22. Who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, 
that is, the place of honor and authority with all angels, and authorities and powers made subservient to him. Who are these spirits of the wicked generation? Picture this, a generation so wicked that they refused to listen to a life-saving message. The result? They perished in a catastrophic flood. It's a haunting reminder of the consequences of sin. The sin of these people. According to the word, they were disobedient, rebellious, unpersuadable, and unbelieving. Their sin is made worse by the fact that God showed them patience and long-suffering for 120 years while Noah was preparing the ark and warning them of the disaster. As a result, they drowned, and their spirits were cast into hell, known as a prison. Nevertheless, Noah and his obedient family were saved in the ark because of their faith. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5 And if he did not spare the ancient world, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness with seven others, when he brought the judgment of a flood upon the world of the ungodly. Who wrote this interesting passage? This interesting passage was written by Peter. Christians are particularly fond of his first letter, which is known for its warmth and relatability. Interestingly, Peter's original name was Simon, which meant read and was quite common. However, when he met Jesus, he was given the name Peter, which was much less common and meant rock. This name change symbolized the transformation of Peter's character that Jesus saw in him. Peter was one of the first two people whom Jesus called to follow him. He was initially a man who easily swayed, like a reed in the wind. However, after Jesus left him, he became as solid as a rock. Peter was the first in every list of the twelve, and he was the unofficial spokesperson for the group. The Gospels clearly portray Peter's character. He had many strengths, such as being charming, eager, impulsive, and energetic. However, these strengths were also accompanied by weaknesses like being unstable, fickle, and cowardly. Why did Peter write this? At this point, it would be beneficial to take a moment to pause and remind ourselves of the fundamental order of thinking that existed throughout this letter, which was written against the backdrop of widespread persecution. Peter's letter was addressed to Christians who were experiencing hardship as a result of their lives and their witness. It's possible that they pondered the question of why, if the Christian faith was correct, they should be suffering. If Christianity was the true faith, then why were there so few people who followed it? Peter is referring to Noah, the faithful preacher who warned people for 120 years that God would destroy the world with water. Despite Noah's warnings, people scorned and rejected him. However, God saved him and his family during the flood, which ultimately vindicated Noah's faithfulness. Within the context of the history of the globe, the majority of people have not always been correct. Even though there are only a few people who have been saved, one's faith should not be shaken by the fact that there are only a few people who are true believers. There were only eight believers in Noah's day. There are millions today. It is not that they were saved by water. They were saved through the water. It was not water that saved them. Rather, it was the judgment that God performed in order to bring them to safety. The ark is a representation of the Lord Jesus Christ. An image of God's judgment is represented by the deluge of water. The ark was the sole means by which one may be saved. Those who were inside the structure were the only ones who survived the flood. Everyone else who was outside of the building perished. So Christ is the only way of salvation. Those who are in Christ are as saved as God himself can make them. The people who are on the outside are completely lost. The ark served as a safe haven for the people. In the process of passing through the water of judgment, the ark was subjected to the full force of the storm. So, Christ bore the fury of God's judgment against our sins. For those who are in Him, there is no judgment. John chapter 5, verse 24. There was water all around the ark, water coming down on top of it and water beneath it. The ark was surrounded by water. On the other hand, it carried its believers across the sea to a place of safety in a renewed creation. Consequently, individuals who put their faith in the Savior are transported in a secure manner through a scene of death and destruction to the place of resurrection and a new life. What did Jesus preach? 
We do not know the precise reason why Jesus preached to the spirits that were confined. Presumably, this was a form of preaching, which is the act of proclaiming the message of God. What his message was, we are not told. Why only those disobedient in the days of Noah are cited is not stated. What the intent or outcome of Christ's preaching was is not displayed. On all these issues, we may construct our own conclusions, but we have no rule for anything verging dogmatic teaching. Three days later, his body and spirit were reunited, and he rose from the dead. Jesus returns to earth, resurrection. Death could not hold him. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the first time in human history that someone has risen from the dead and will never again experience death. Some of those who were resurrected later succumbed to death a second time. The Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit raised Jesus from the dead. Romans tells us that the Father raised Jesus from the dead. Romans chapter 6, verse 4. We have therefore been buried with him through baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory and power of the Father, we too might walk habitually in newness of life, abandoning our old ways. And it says that Jesus raised himself from the dead in John chapter 2, verse 18. The resurrection was the work of the triune God. John chapter 2, verses 18 through 22. Then the Jews retorted, What sign, a testing miracle, can you show us as proof of your authority for doing these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews replied, it took 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple, which was his body. So, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered what he had said, and they believed and trusted in and relied on the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. The Results of Jesus' Resurrection in the Physical World The world of the Spirit can be quite confusing. However, we do note something happened in the physical when Jesus died and was resurrected. This time, we see the immediate results of Jesus' death with those who are righteous. After that, Matthew describes an event that is not included in any of the other Gospels. The tombs broke open, and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. The resurrection of Jesus caused them to emerge from the graves. And after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to a large number of people. Even while earthquakes have the potential to cause damage to tombs because they are made of stone, the fact that the bodies are being raised can only be attributed to the direct intervention of God. In Matthew's writings, he highlights how Jesus' sacrifice on the cross brings victory over death. He used the phrase, those who had fallen asleep, to describe the people who are raised which is a common expression in the New Testament to refer to someone who has died but has a secure, eternal destiny. The miraculous accounts of the Holy One's bodies being raised and appearing in Jerusalem serve as a powerful testimony to the completed work of Jesus on the cross and His subsequent resurrection. The term, holy people, denotes devout individuals from the Old Testament era. For instance, we can draw a parallel between the manner in which Moses and Elijah were chosen to appear alongside Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. In this particular instance, the text refers to the resurrection of the bodies of holy individuals. This serves to demonstrate that despite the judgment of Jesus on the leadership of Israel and their condemnation in chapters 23 through 24, Israel still holds a significant place in God's plans. In the writings of Ezekiel, it was prophesied that the Supreme Lord would bring back to life those who had passed away in a valley where even bones had turned to dust. Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 11 through 14. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are completely cut off. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and make you come up out of your graves, my people, and I will bring you back home to the land of Israel. Then you will know with confidence that I am the Lord, when I have opened your graves and made you come up out of your graves, my people. I will put my spirit in you, 
and you will come to life, and I will place you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and fulfilled it, says the Lord. Matthew lets this event stand unadorned because its meaning is clear. Derek Tidball relates, The raising of these holy ones is a foretaste of the resurrection to which all believers can look forward. Through the death of Jesus, a new day has arrived, a day when death has been defeated by death, and resurrection to life eternal has been made possible. Matthew does not answer all the questions we would like answered about these miraculous events, but in narrating them, he presents a unified testimony to the supernatural confirmation of Jesus' identity. Where is Jesus now? Where does Jesus reside? We find the answer to this. After the resurrection, Jesus told the disciples he didn't want their hearts to be troubled by all of this, even though it was legitimately troubling for them. John chapter 14, verses 1 through 2. Do not let your heart be troubled, afraid, cowardly. Believe confidently in God and trust in Him. Have faith, hold on to it, rely on it, keep going, and believe also in me. The thought seems to be, I am going away, and you will not be able to see me. But let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, and yet you do not see Him. Now, believe in me in the same way. Here is another important claim to equality with God. John chapter 14, verses 2 through 4. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, because I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back again, and I will take you to myself, so that where I am you may be also, and to the place where I am going you know the way. The Father's house refers to heaven, where there are many dwelling places. It is large enough to accommodate all the redeemed. If it were not so, the Lord would have told them He would not have them build on false hopes. John chapter 14, verses 5-6 through 6. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the only way to God and the real truth and the real life. No one comes to the Father but through me. He was going to heaven, and they knew the way to heaven, for he had told them many times. Apparently, Thomas did not understand the meaning of the Lord's words. Like Peter, he may have been thinking of a journey to some place on earth. In my Father's house are many mansions. Jesus spoke with complete confidence about heaven, here spoken of as his Father's house. In addition to knowing about life beyond this earth, Jesus told his disciples that there would be room for all in heaven, many mansions. Mansions are better translated as dwelling places in light of the ancient Greek. The noun mon, connected to the verb meno, to stay or remain, means a place to stay. In light of God's nature, it is better to translate it as dwelling places. God will provide us with a magnificent dwelling place in heaven. There will be many such dwelling places. Jesus could see what the disciples never could. He may have even smiled when he said, Many mansions, many indeed. We read, I go to prepare a place for you. Love prepares a welcome. The expectant parents prepare the baby's room with love. With love, the host prepares for her guests. Jesus goes ahead and makes preparations for his people because he loves them and is certain that they will come. I go speaks of Jesus' own planning and initiative. He wasn't taken to the cross. He went there. They thought that his death was an unforeseen calamity. Christ taught them that it was the path of his own planning. Morrison I will come again to receive you to myself. During Jesus' time on earth, he promised that he would return for his disciples. This was not only in the sense of his soon resurrection or in the coming of the Holy Spirit. Jesus also had in mind the great gathering together of his people at the end of the age. They were not to think of him as having ceased to be when they could not see him. He had only gone to another abiding place to prepare for their coming, and moreover, he would come back to receive them. We read, That where I am, there you may be also. The entire focus of heaven is being united with Jesus. Heaven is heaven, not because of streets of gold, pearly gates, or even the presence of angels. Heaven is heaven 
because Jesus is there. We take comfort in knowing that even as he prepares a place for us, Jesus also prepares us for that place. This lovely verse makes it clear that the Lord Jesus Christ is himself the way to heaven. He does not merely show the way, he is the way. Salvation is in a person. Accept that person as your own, and you have salvation. Christianity is Christ. The Lord Jesus is not just one of many ways. He is the only way. No one comes to the Father except through Him. Christ is the only way to God, not the Ten Commandments, the Golden Rule, ordinances, or church membership. Then, the Lord is the truth. He is not just one who teaches the truth. He is the truth. He is the embodiment of truth. Those who have Christ have the truth. It is not found anywhere else. Christ Jesus is the life. He is the source of life, both spiritual and eternal. Those who receive him have eternal life because he is the life. We read, Lord, we do not know where you are going. The fact that Thomas explained his confusion in such a clear and honest manner is something that we should appreciate. We thought Jesus was simply going to another place as if it were another city. Heaven is a wonderful home. We are going to the Father's place. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you, our home. When you come to the house of God, you are home, and Jesus is preparing our eternal home. The Lord will come back again into the air when those who have died in faith will be raised. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as indeed the rest of mankind do who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose from the dead, so also God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep through Jesus. For we say this to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who remain, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Jesus laid plans for the Holy Spirit to finish the work he had begun. Scripture demonstrates that Jesus' ascension was a literal and bodily return to heaven. As he rose slowly from the ground, he was received into a cloud, while his disciples and other astonished onlookers stared in wonder as he rose. Then two angels appeared and promised Christ's return, in just the same way that you have watched him go. Acts chapter 1, verse 11. And they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. This marked the end of the human limitations Jesus had during his earthly ministry. Some of the attributes he possessed as God had been temporarily suspended, but now the suspension was over. His heavenly glory returned, a glimpse of which was seen as the transfiguration. Jesus' place is at the right hand of God, the place of divine honor. Other passages that indicate Jesus' presence in heaven are Luke chapter 22, verse 69. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. Moments before he passed away, Stephen had a vision in which he looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. According to the Bible, Jesus currently resides in an actual location known as heaven, a realm of glory and home to God. God's angels, and all of God's redeemed children. Two men that saw Jesus after he went to heaven. According to the word of God, Jesus is at the right hand of God the Father right now. Apostle Paul, imagine you meet Jesus face to face. What would you do? You would think it would be a delightful day. However, it would be one of the most challenging days in Paul's life. Before his conversion, Saul was a Pharisee of Pharisees who intensely persecuted the followers of Jesus. According to the account in Acts, his conversion occurred on the road to Damascus, where he reported having experienced a vision of the resurrected Jesus. At this time, Saul of Tarsus was probably in his early 30s. As he watched the growth of the Christian faith, known as the Way, he saw in it a threat to his own religion. 
So, without boundless energy, he set out to destroy his pernicious sect. Now, as he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, but get up and enter the city, and it will be told to you what you must do. The men who were traveling with him were in a complete daze. They had heard a sound from heaven, but not the articulate words that Saul had heard. They had not seen the Lord. Only Saul had seen him and had been called to apostleship at this time. The haughty Pharisee was now being led by the hand into Damascus, where he was blind for three days. During that time, he didn't eat or drink anything. Another man that witnessed Jesus in heaven is John the Apostle. We see this in the book of Revelation. The title of this book, Revelation, originates from the primary event it describes, which is the manifestation of Jesus Christ to the people living on earth in the final days. Revelation opens with Jesus as the revealer. John was to document the things he had seen. John sees a powerful Jesus that does not compare to any typical man. However, before John gazes at Jesus, he first hears his voice. Revelation chapter 1, verses 10 through 13. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard him with a loud voice, as of a trumpet, saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. This was it. John had seen the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, the Honored One. According to John, the loud voice he heard was as distinctive and striking as a trumpet. The powerful voice is that of the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, who stand at the beginning and the end of everything. Because Jesus identified himself with these names in Revelation chapter 1, verse 18, we know this was the loud voice of Jesus. The first and the last is a title that belongs to the Lord, Yahweh, the God of Israel. The titles Alpha and Omega have the same idea as first and the last. This is one of the New Testament passages where Jesus clearly claimed to be God. We can only imagine what went through John's mind as he turned. The sound of the voice he heard most likely did not match up perfectly with the way he recalled Jesus' voice sounding. John described it as of a trumpet, Revelation chapter 1, verse 10. However, he knew it was Jesus because the voice described itself as the Alpha and Omega. After spending so much time with Jesus throughout his ministry on earth, John finally had the opportunity to meet him face to face after all these years. Jesus' title, Someone, like a son of man, recalls the figure who would reign as God's agent. Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 through 14. Jesus' face also shines like the sun. Greek texts sometimes portray deity shining like the sun or lightning. Jewish texts did the same for angels and others, but also for God himself. Revelation chapter 10, verse 1. Then I saw another angel coming down from heaven, clothed in a cloud, with a rainbow halo over his head, and his face was like the sun, and his feet, legs, were like columns of fire. John then continues in Revelation chapter 1, verses 16 through 17. In his right hand he held seven stars, and from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword of judgment, and his faith, reflecting his majesty and the Shekinah glory, was like the sun shining in all its power at midday. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. And he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, absolute deity, the Son of God. Even though John was an apostle who had known Jesus while he was on earth, he was overcome with wonder after seeing this incredible vision. Even the three years that John lived on earth with Jesus did not adequately prepare him for the moment when Jesus appeared to him in his heavenly majesty. In that moment, John realized the divine power and majesty Jesus gave up while living on earth. At this moment, 
John knew what a miracle it was that Jesus could shield his glory and authority while he walked this earth. Revelation chapter 1, verse 18. And the living one, and I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and of Hades. First, Jesus brought John some solace by touching him compassionately. Perhaps the touch of Jesus felt more familiar than the appearance of Jesus. Then Jesus said to John, Do not be afraid. John had no reason to be afraid because he was in the presence of Jesus, who clearly identified himself to John with three titles. Jesus is the first and the last, the God of all eternity, Lord of eternity past and eternity future. Jesus is the one who lives and was dead and is alive forevermore. He possesses resurrection credentials and lives to never die again. The victory that Jesus achieved over sin and death was eternal. He didn't rise from the dead just to die again. Jesus is the only one who possesses the keys to Hades and death. Some believe that the devil has the authority or power to decide who lives and who dies. They are obviously mistaken because only Jesus has the keys to Hades and death. Who now holds the keys of death and Hades? Who holds the keys of death and Hades? I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Revelation chapter 1, verse 18. It is Jesus who says this to John. This conversation is essential as this is the last personal meeting with Jesus recorded in the Bible. By possessing the keys of death, the risen Christ has control and authority over death. When Jesus died, he did so at his own timing. When he gave up his spirit, the news that Jesus was already dead surprised Pilate. Having authority over death, Jesus was able to rise from the dead after giving up his spirit. Moreover, he has the power to release his followers from death in order that they may be with him forever. Think of giving someone the key to the city. This key is sometimes a large, cartoonish key that fits no lock but symbolizes honor. Those given keys to the city are welcomed and honored within that city. Keys are frequently referred to in the Bible as symbols of authority and control. Any individual with a master key to a building has the authority to enter any room and open any door in the building. In everyday life, the key is a symbol of real ownership and power. When the tenant gives the key back to the landlord, the owner once again has control over and possession of the house. Our Lord Jesus Christ still remains supreme. The word Hades signifies the dwelling place of spirits. Luke chapter 16, verse 26. And besides all this, between us and you, people, a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who want to come over from here to you will not be able, and none may cross over from there to us. It is Christ's key that hath shut in the lost spirits. Christ conquered death because he was sinless. The curse upon mankind in the Garden of Eden, brought about by sin, was plainly stated. Christ has conquered death, and the consequences for us are eternal. It is Christ's victory over death that underpins the good news of the gospel. Without the resurrection, there is no gospel indeed. There is no hope for us at all. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 17. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless and powerless, mere delusion. You are still in your sins and under the control and penalty of sin. Other seers filled the people of God with the yearning that the Lord would one day abolish death. Hosea chapter 13, verse 14. Shall I ransom them from the power of Sheol, the place of the dead? Shall I redeem them from death? O death, where are your thorns? O Sheol, where is your sting? Compassion is hidden from my eyes because of their failure to repent. Isaiah chapter 25, verse 8. He will swallow up death and abolish it for all time. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. And he will take away the disgrace of his people from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. Death was the devil's most powerful, terrifying weapon against us. Believers are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Christ has conquered death. And believers stand firm on Jesus' words. It is imperative that we do not forget that the Father is the one who bestowed upon Jesus Christ the right to occupy this exalted position of authority and dignity as a reward for what he has done. 
Look what he has gotten in return for the humiliation he suffered at the hands of man. He was the servant of servants, but now he is king of kings and lord of lords. He stooped lower than the lowest, and he has risen higher than the highest. He wore the crown of thorns, but now he wears the crown of heaven. He was the servant of servants, but now he is the lord of lords and the king of kings. Let us worship him. Let our hearts, as we ponder these simple but priceless truths, come and spread their treasures at His feet, and let us enthrone Him as Lord over everything. The truth is that people fear one thing most of all, and that thing is death. That is because, to the world, death is an unknown. Unsaved people feel fear when they consider what lies ahead. Will I have to answer for what I've done, what I've not done? Will I burn in hell forever, or will I reach a state of eternal bliss? And don't be misled, hell is real. Whether most people admit it or not, death changes people's lives. After our lives on earth is over, Christians will walk in a victorious march, following Christ. There is no reason at all to be afraid for any person who believes in Christ. This should make us say, Let us worship Him who hath the keys of hell and death. Let us come into His presence with thanksgiving, and show ourselves glad in Him with songs.